Hi everybody, I hope you're doing well. I'll tell you, growing up, I'd come home from school hungry and head straight for the fridge. Mom, there's nothing for afternoon snack. And my mom's like, oh Candace, just have an apple. I'm sick of apples, mom. Then have an orange or a banana. And I'm like, can't we ever have Pop-Tarts in this house or Oreo cookies? But no. So ever since, I'm not so crazy about apples or oranges. Although, coincidentally, in our video today, we're talking about fruit. So let's get started. Our study starts at the point of our salvation. The instant that we place our faith in Christ, something pretty amazing happens. The Lord takes a portion of himself, a portion of his spirit, and he transfers this to us. He deposits a portion of himself into us. It's kind of like this. One Christmas, my sisters and I got an Easy Bake Oven, a Betty Crocker Easy Bake Oven. Now this was a toy oven that really worked. And our mom would be in the kitchen making a cake and she'd pour a spoonful of her batter into our little pan. And we'd slide the pan into our Easy Bake and wait while it baked and it smelled so yummy. And at last, oh look, a real cake just like mommy's. And you know, except for its miniature size, our cake was exactly like mommy's. Our little cake came from the same batter as mom's, same ingredients, same proportions, one box of Betty Crocker chocolate cake mix, one cup of water, one third cups of oil, three eggs. Now, for just a minute, let's think of God's spirit as being a cake, which is a little bit weird, I know, but just go with me on this, okay? Now, a list of the ingredients comprising God's cake batter would look like this. Equal parts of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And if these look familiar, they should because they're from a very famous passage, Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. And this is the fruit we're talking about today. Now, these ingredients listed aren't just any ones you find in the baking aisle. These are nothing less than the very character traits of the Lord God Almighty. And when God shares a portion of His Spirit with us, of His cake batter, He's pouring into us a measure of His character traits. Now, a natural question is, well, why does God do this? Why does God share some of his spirit with us? Is it so we can perform miraculous signs and wonders? Heal the sick? Raise the dead? No, no, no. That was God's purpose back in the Acts period. God has a different purpose for us today. His purpose for giving his spirit in the age of grace is to grow and develop in us believers the fruits of his spirit so that we will grow to be more and more like his son, like Christ. Now more on this in a minute. Here's another question. When my mom poured cake batter into our little Easy Bake pan, raw, was that batter ready to eat? Well, yeah, if you don't mind salmonella poisoning, but no, that to transform that raw batter into a yummy little chocolate cake, we had to bake it in our Easy Bake. Now God's Spirit in us works kind of the same way. It's like we're the oven and God pours his cake batter into us, raw. Then for the character traits of God's Spirit to grow and mature inside of us, we have to bake them, of course. The Easy Bake oven used two ordinary light bulbs as a heat source. And the heating element needed to bake God's cake batter, his character traits poured into us, is scripture. For the character traits of the living Word of God to grow and develop in our hearts and minds, we have to bake it with the written Word of God, with the Bible. We need to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, abundantly. And as the word dwell indicates, the Word of Christ should reside in our hearts and minds. We're not talking about stopping in now and then as an occasional visitor. Hi there, long time no see. No. The Word of God should pull up with a U-Haul truck and unload every last word into our hearts and minds and move in as a permanent residence. And here's how we make this happen. Here's how we bake God's cake better, comprised of the fruits of His Spirit, which 
Come to think of it, this would give us fruitcakes. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Number one, and this seems kind of obvious, but we need to read scripture. It's disappointing to learn that only 8% of Christians read the Bible daily. We need to be reading our Bible every day. Number two, we need to memorize scripture. We need to get it deep down into the basement of our brains, into the foundation of our being. Number three, we need to study scripture, be a student of the word, use Bible study tools for deeper understanding, Bible dictionaries, maps, commentaries, videos. Number four, listen to scripture being read. Now, I like to fall asleep listening to the Bible. I began doing this way back in the days of cassette tapes, in the days of the Sony Walkman. And these cassettes played 30 minutes to a side, which was fine until the tape reached the end of side one and slammed to a stop and bam, and now I'm wide awake. Today, we can listen to the Bible with apps on our phones, podcasts, websites. Now, we're reading the scripture, we're studying, memorizing, we're baking God's cake batter, and we're getting to really know the Lord, his character, how he operates, his love for us, and something is happening to us. A change is taking place. Our thoughts and our frame of mind are conforming with God's thoughts in his word. We're being transformed by the renewing of our mind. The Lord through his word and his spirit is working inside us, changing us as people. We're being conformed to the image of his son. We're being more and more like Christ. And this change inside us, it shows up on the outside. It shows up in our day-to-day -day behavior and attitude. It can be observed in our daily walk. And guess what? This is why God wants us to grow in the character of Christ. It's so the unsaved world can see the fruits of God's Spirit in action. It's so the world can witness the Lord's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and the rest, so they can see God's character traits lived out by us right before their eyes, and especially when circumstances are hard. Let's take the fruit of joy. An acquaintance, Ed, just a joyful guy. Well, Ed got carjacked at gunpoint but not before suffering a serious beatdown by the perpetrator. And Ed spent weeks in the hospital and he's still not fully recovered. And most will say, that poor guy. But Ed's outlook and the way he's living out each day, they say otherwise. He's still his joyful old self. And uh, I'm not talking to, you know, a fixed grin plastered ear to ear. Oh, joy, isn't everything wonderful? No, it's not that, but it's just a, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just a genuine gladness of heart in spite of his circumstances. And people notice, people look at Ed and go, how does he do that? He should be so angry. He should be feeling sorry for himself. And who could blame him really? But Ed's joy is a joy that can only be produced by God, working through His Word and His Spirit, working in Ed's heart and mind, producing fruit, producing joy. All right, so we've got a carjacking, a vicious assault. This is ugly stuff. And let's face it, our world is ugly. It's dark out there. But here's where we believers come in. Now, I don't mean to save the day like cartoon superheroes, but we come in to be a light in the darkness. And this is a purpose for us in this age of grace. God is developing his character traits in us so he can display the fruits of his spirit through us so that the lost might be drawn to Christ as they see him lived out through us, the children of God. The Lord wants us to shine as lights in the world he wants us to walk as children of light. And through us believers, God is serving up to the world a taste of himself, a taste of the fruits of his spirit. Hey, everybody, taste and see that the Lord is good. We're like vendors at Costco passing out samples of pizza rolls, except we believers are passing out samples of the Lord, of what it looks like to be in relationship with God and to walk in his ways. And all the while, we're hoping that maybe some of the lost will say, mm, mm, 
That fruit looks good. I want a taste of that. Where can I get some of that fruit? Let's recap. We have the fruit of God's Spirit dwelling in us, baking inside of our oven, right? Heated by Scripture. God's character traits are growing and developing inside us, and we're becoming more like Christ in our character in order to be lights for Him in this life, in the here and now. Okay, so, have we completed our study of the fruit of the Spirit? Is class dismissed? Not quite. This video is titled, From Here to Eternity. We've studied the here, but it turns out our growing in the Spirit has only begun. So let's move on to eternity. First, in regards to our portion of God's Spirit, Scripture gives a name to this portion. Scripture calls a guarantee. We read about this in Ephesians chapter 1, 13. In Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed. Now, the gospel of salvation, this should sound familiar because I began this video saying that the course of our study today kicks off with our salvation. And here our Ephesians verse talks of our believing the gospel of salvation. And let's summarize that gospel right now. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. We believe that. Christ died to pay the penalty for our sins and that he was buried proving that he really died on that cross and that he rose again on the third day proving he really was God in human flesh the Savior of the world okay moving on we're still in verse 13 which goes on to say you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise Okay, when we believe the gospel, we're giving the whole, given the Holy Spirit who seals us or marks us as belonging to God. On to verse 14, still speaking of the Holy Spirit, and here it comes, the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Here's our word guarantee. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a guarantee, which means as a deposit, as earnest money, as a down payment. And we're like, down payment? Down payment on what, like a condo in Florida or what? No, verse 14 tells us, the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. The Holy Spirit is given as a down payment on our inheritance. And we're going, we've got an inheritance? Who knew? Well, the first mention of this inheritance was up in verse 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things. Right off the bat, we're sidetracked by the word predestined. Oh no, she's going all Calvinism on us. No, she's not. Predestined does not mean that God chooses who will be saved and who will not be saved. It has nothing to do with salvation. Predestined here just means predetermined, designated ahead of time or placed in a position to re receive something or to do something in the future. I'll tell you about a family with four grown children, one of whom had a serious addiction to drugs. Well, Brad's parents said, no, we're not leaving this child an inheritance, which he'll only shoot up his arm or snort up his nose. So they left him out of their will. Well, long story short, Brad eventually made a decision to enter a treatment program. He got clean, he stayed clean, he turned his life around, and his parents added his name to their will, which placed Brad in a position to receive his portion of the family inheritance. Brad was now predestined to receive his inheritance. Now, our Ephesians verse says that we're predestined to obtain an inheritance, that we're in a position to obtain an inheritance. Okay, we do need some more information first. When exactly is it that we are placed in position to receive our inheritance? When is our name written in the will? Well, Brad made a decision. He decided to enter treatment. And this decision is what ultimately placed him in position to inherit his portion of his parents' estate. Brad's being in treatment is what got him in the will, in position for his inheritance. And then in a similar way, a decision on our part is what predestines us to receive our inheritance. And the decision we make is to believe the gospel of our salvation, to place our faith in Christ. And this decision is what places us in Christ, in Him. 
up to this point we were in Adam. But now we're in Christ and thereby we are designated to receive our inheritance. We are in position to receive our inheritance. We are predestined. Well, next, what is our inheritance? What is it? Ephesians 1 verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. It says here that the inheritance we are predestined to obtain is adoption as sons. And I bet you guys are going adoption as sons. What does that even mean? Well, we're not talking about adoption as adopting, adopting a child into your family. For us to understand adoption here, we need to understand something about the New Testament. The New Testament was written in Greek, but it was written by ancestral Hebrews who wrote with a cultural mindset of a Jew. So in our day, we think of a son as a male offspring, but in biblical times, in the Jewish mindset, the son was the child in the family, usually the oldest child and usually a male. The son was the child who would take the place of authority in the family when the father could no longer run the family. The son was the one who was selected and trained from the time he was a child to take over the running of the family and the family business. Then when the time came where the father was too old or ill or the son steps up and takes over, he represents the father in running the family and all the family business dealings. And so this is the Hebrew tradition known as adoption as a son. Now Ephesians 1 verse 5 says that we believers are predestined to adoption as a son, meaning apparently that we will serve as a representative in some sort of position of responsibility. Okay, represent who? Ephesians 1.5 again, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. And if we're reading this right, it says that we believers in Christ are predestined to serve as representatives in some capacity for the one who adopts us as sons. And the one who adopts as his sons happens to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Have we got this right? So what, we can walk up to a stranger on the sidewalk and say, hello there, I'd like to introduce myself. I am a son of God. I am an official representative of the Lord God Almighty. I have his authority to make certain decisions. Okay, that's just ridiculous. Let's make something clear. We are not sons right now. We're only predetermined to become sons. Right now, we are children of God. Yes, we're saved by grace, but we're still rotten little sinners. With sin-infected hearts, living in our sin-infected bodies. We hardly qualify to serve as representatives of the Lord in this sorry state. We possess only a portion of the Spirit of God, just a down payment, enough to grow in God's character to a certain extent, and enough to be a light for Him in this world, but not enough to be a full-grown son. It's like my mom pouring us girls just enough batter to fill our miniature cake pan. That teeny cake would never provide dessert for our family of seven, though. Right now, we believers are like, Little easy bake cakes. We don't have enough of God's batter to be a full size layer cake. All right, when is it? When do we receive the rest of our cake batter? When do we receive the remainder of the Spirit, our full portion of the Spirit? When do we receive our inheritance? Well, clearly we don't get everything we're going to receive from the Lord in the here and now. And thank God for that because if our inheritance were already here, in this life, we'd look around us and think, yeah, this is kind of crummy. The Apostle Paul even says, if this life is all there is, we are most miserable. But we believers are not miserable. That's because we have a special hope. Understanding that the word hope in Greek means not, I hope, I hope, but hope, a confident expectation that something is certain to happen. And what is our hope? Titus chapter 3, verse 7. Those of us who have been justified by His grace, meaning declared righteous when we believed, we should become heirs because we believed we're now in the will to inherit a portion of His estate. 
and we become heirs according to the hope according to our confident expectation of receiving the inheritance we are heirs to according to the hope of eternal life our hope is eternal life resurrection to eternal life this is when we'll receive our inheritance remember in the here and now we are marked out as belonging to the lord with a down payment of the holy spirit he put a hold on us and guaranteed that he would make the full payment to redeem us at a later time and from titus 3 7 we learned when that later time is it's in the next life it's in eternity God will purchase us in full make that full payment with the remainder of his spirit and redeem us at the dawn of eternity in that future day of redemption and in the meantime we've said it's a dark world out there and it's getting darker by the minute which should be no surprise since human race says yeah God we don't need you we're gonna govern ourselves we're gonna do things our way so hit the road God we don't want you thank God this ungodly darkness won't last forever it's promised all over scripture that the moment will come when God will intervene God will say that is enough the Lord will shut down our current times and he'll bring in the next life he'll bring in eternity the Lord is going to break right into history and flood the world with his spirit with his light of truth God will take back control of the human governments of this world. The Lord will govern the world in justice and fairness and righteousness. In the past, God often worked through intermediaries, through prophets, priests, kings, and he delegated some of his responsibility and authority to these, and then they spoke and acted on God's behalf. They represented him. Well, in God's coming administration in the next life, he'll delegate some of his responsibility and authority once again. And here's where we come in. Here comes our inheritance. Here comes our adoption as sons. It's when God takes back his government at the dawn of eternity. At that day of redemption, that's when the Lord will redeem you and me with our full portion of his spirit and all that comes with it. A new glorious body like his, a body that never dies, the full gift of the Holy Spirit living and active in our hearts and minds, even speaking audibly to us, guiding us, instructing us in our roles as sons, and of course, we'll be filled with our full portion of the fruits of his Spirit, with the ripened fruits of love, joy, peace, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now we're all grown up. Well, we'll always be growing in Christ, but we're no longer children of God. Now, in the next life, at last, we are sons of God. We're conformed to the image of His Son. And as His sons, we're appointed to serve as representatives of the Lord in whatever position or responsibility or authority he places us, be that as a teacher of his character or of his word, or perhaps as a representative in his government, whatever position of service the Lord places us, this is our inheritance. And man, what a privilege to represent the Lord God in some capacity in the life to come, to serve him as his sons, just like it said we would in Ephesians chapter 1. And by the way, those of you who plan to spend eternity floating on a cloud, plucking on a harp, you can go ahead and cancel those harp lessons. Now, mind you, we'll never be Christ. We'll never be equal with God. We'll never possess God's sovereignty. Only Christ himself has all the authority of the Father. Again, we're not sons of God yet. In this present life, in the here, as children of God, we're spending our time immersing ourselves in the Word of God, letting it dwell in us richly, and the fruits of God's Spirit in us are growing and maturing, and we're becoming more like Christ in our character and our daily walk, so we can be of some influence for Christ, so we can share Christ and be a light for Him in this dark world. And we're waiting in hope in confident expectation for that promised day when the Lord breaks into history and pours out the full gift of His Spirit. 
when we believers will then serve Him as sons for eternity. Or I could say, we're waiting for that day when the Lord pours out the remaining cake batter into us from His great big mixing bowl in the sky, and we become a full-size chocolate layer cake with chocolate frosting. Amen. Now, I'll be covering the fruits of the Spirit individually in future videos. And right now, I'll tell you, with all this talk of, cho talk of chocolate cake, I want some. And I know I should exercise the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of self-control, and have an apple or an orange or a banana. But forget it, I'm heading for the fridge to scrounge for a big old slice of chocolate cake. Until next time.